like you to, um, if you have not already, make sure you note the announcements on the back of the bulletin as well as the calendar on the inside cover. Um, if you have not attended any of these classes or events, take note of time and place and know that everyone is always welcome. If you haven't already, please um, grab the pew pad and um, let us know you are here this morning. If you are a visitor, we have the connection cards. They are in the racks in the pew in front of you. Um, and just a heads up, if you will turn to the second page of the bulletin, and if you want to grab a pen or a pencil, we have one correction to make to the bulletin this morning. The hymn following the sermon will be number 697, Take My Life. I did try the lyrics to a woman in a coin last night to that hymn tune doesn't work very well. So you might want to make sure you are um, have that marked. That hymn is number 697, Take My Life, which I know many of you will recognize. Um, I believe that is it for announcements this morning. So let us worship God. Please join in the responsive call to worship. Jesus reminds us today that you cannot serve God and wealth. Open us to your truth, Lord. Open us to honesty. Let us enter worship humbly, ready to realign our faith according to God's word.
Let us trust the love of God and come in humility to acknowledge our need for grace and forgiveness. Let us pray. O oh God, we are indebted to you and your generosity, but we fail to forgive our debtors. We confiscate and consume far more than our fair share. We neglect the poor and trap people in poverty, claiming that debt forgiveness is unfair. Liberate us from our spiritual and moral bondage. Grant us a season of jubilee. Reorder our communities so that all may contribute and all may thrive. Amen. Friends, let's take just a few moments for personal reflection. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Friends, no human being can follow Christ perfectly. No human organization or institution can fulfill the desires of God completely, that all live abundantly. And nevertheless, we are called to see where we need to grow, where we need to mend or repair, where we need to right what is wrong, we misstep, and we learn from our missteps. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Good news is this, we are forgiven. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you all. And let us share this peace with one another.
When I got here a little over a year ago and said that I would be shaking things up, well, <laughs> not, yeah, even I lose track sometimes. So now, after that wonderful um, praise uh, to God, I'm going to invite our young disciples to join me up in the front pew, if you would like, and then you'll have some time with that city. If you'd like to join me up in the front, right in the front pew here, just, and Yatsiri is up here as well, so you'll be joining her. Oh, I have something for that. Okay, so I'm going to share with you one sentence from the Bible that we're going to read, the adults are going to read a little bit later, okay? And see if you can tell me, see if you can tell me what, what you understand or what you hear this is saying to us. First of all, I ask that requests, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So the person who wrote this is saying, I'm asking for prayers. For who? Just my family? For all people. Do you ever pray for all people? Or just for your family? Do you pray for yourself? I hope so, because you're important. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so it's OK to pray for yourself. And I hope you can pray for your family. And next, pray for all people. What, what kinds of things do we want to pray about? What do, we, what do we hope for ourselves? What do we pray to pray about? You have any ideas? Yeah, that's a good one. Say it again. Your dog. Your dog. Yeah, your dog needs prayers too. We want to care for them, right? And so we can pray for our pets. Other things you pray about? You pray for your mom? Do you pray for your mom? Yeah? So these are the things that God asks us to remember. And sometimes we forget. I have something in my hand that I want you to use today. And you have your choice. Yatsidi, can you show them these pictures? Those are cards. I want you to pick one of these cards. There are four of them. And I want you to pick one of those. So you're, I want you to use those today, and you can either draw a picture inside, or you can write something in there. And I want you to think about a prayer you might have. It can be a prayer that says, thank you, God, for my home, my pet. Thank you. Or it can be, I'm praying for my pet, that my pet will be safe. Pray for my mom that she'll be safe every day when I'm at school. So I want you to think about a prayer you might have for someone, yourself, and use that card to either write it or draw a picture. Draw a picture of who you're thinking about. It could be yourself. It could be your pet. It could be a family member. Yeah, it could be a friend. Maybe you have a friend that needs a prayer today. But that's what I want you to think about today, just for a few moments, okay? Because that's what the Bible is telling us grown-ups to pray for all people. So that's what we're going to be thinking about is other people. So I want us to think about that as children, too. So let us pray here. Loving God, we thank you that you love and care for all people, even the ones that are hard to love. And sometimes we have a hard time loving others. But we know that you love all people and you love us. We pray that we may recognize that love. And so we pray also for all of the adults in the lives of these young children that they may show them love. We pray for the adults to show care and understanding and love. Protect these young ones. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for spending just a few minutes with me. You can go with Yatsiri if you'd like or return to your, your family. It's
It's your choice. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. As we approach your word, may, be, may we be ready to receive the message you intend for us today. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the New Testament book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Listen for the word of the Lord. First of all, then, I ask that requests, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Pray for kings and everyone who is in authority so that we can live a quiet and peaceful life in complete godliness and dignity. This is right, and it pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the human Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a payment to set all people free. This was a testimony that was given at the right time. I was appointed to be a preacher and apostle of this testimony I'm telling the truth, and I'm not lying. I'm a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Now the second reading today <clears throat> comes from the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> Again, Jesus teaching his disciples, as well as any who might be over here, over um, eavesdropping. Jesus also said to the disciples, a certain rich man heard that his household manager was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. The household manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig, too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their houses. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write 450 gallons. Then the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, take your contract and write 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. People who belong to this world are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, 
or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God. It's probably a good idea, and it remains to be seen how this is a good way for us to enter into this season of the church year. Uh, Fall is generally the time when we begin to look at the stewardship campaign and asking you to think about your pledging for the 2023 budget. Money talk. (laughs) But we're not quite there yet. Or hopefully we've been there all year long. You've been thinking about how do I use the resources at my disposal. But this morning in thinking about this particular Luke passage, over and over again I asked this question. It doesn't matter how long I've been looking at scripture or dealing with it or studying it. Why can't Jesus just be clear? Why tell these parables? They're set in an ancient time, a different culture, another language. Doesn't God know that things get lost in translation? Yikes. I think that alone would give us pause whenever we approach scripture because we are reading it how many languages removed from the original text and context. Most of the gospel I get, love God above all else and with your whole being, love your neighbor as you would love yourself, I get that. But then there are these parables of Jesus. I guess he thought they were a pretty good teaching tool because he keeps using them. And the book of Luke has a particular take on the use of parables. Go back and read chapter 8 where Luke says, quote, when a great crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from one city after another, he spoke to them in a parable. He tells this parable, a farmer went out to scatter his seed. And then Jesus goes on to tell this story about the sower and the seeds. Some of the seed falling on good ground, some on rocky ground, some on the path and get trampled on, some the birds take away. So some seeds producing an abundance of grain and some seed dying or not ever having a chance to produce anything. Also in this particular piece of this passage of chapter eight, His disciples asked him what this parable of the sower and the seeds meant, and he said, You have been given the mysteries of God's kingdom, but these mysteries come to everyone else in parables, so that when they see, they can't see. When they hear, they can't understand. Darn it! Doesn't that, that makes me mad. <laughs> Because if I consider myself a disciple, but I still can't understand, what does that say about my discipleship? I don't know. I don't worry too long, though. I get all riled up a little bit, and then it forces me to keep digging, keep searching, keep studying, and also engaging others in conversation. What do you think that means? What, what is the lesson you take away from this? So this confusion of not understanding, this can be true not just for Jesus' first audience, but for everyone else who hears these parables. And I can understand why folks would flock to a church, auditorium, coliseum, stadium of thousands, tens of thousands to hear 10 steps for expanding worship attendance or six reasons why generation X, Y, Z have no interest in the church on what to do about it. Let's solve your problems. I think there can be good reasons for understanding another generation, of course, but expecting that there's a formula for this. We just get the formula right. 
That will answer our question of how we become a church of all generations. I think that's short-sighted. There is no formula. There is no formula. There is, however, an invitation and a challenge for creating community and different kinds of relationships. That, I think, is consistent throughout scripture. I would say that the best way we can handle this kind of confusing parable, especially in these times of deep division in our country, is to be clear about the kind of community we are and share generously with the world what we have come to know about God's love, grace, and care. That's what's missing in the world, a generosity of spirit and care, that deep-seated value of this particular nation of the um, lone individual who sets out to make their way in the world and by God, I will do it on my own. I don't need your help, thank you. I don't need charity. That myth prevails. This myth of uh, meritocracy also prevails when we know that systems are rigged, there is injustice. We do need to make things right upon examination. And it's by wrestling with these scriptures that challenge the status quo that the spirit is able to ignite within us different kinds of vision and a communal understanding of the kingdom of God that is not based on the rules of domination or might makes right, or you gotta have money to make money. Mm. We too often succumb to the values of this world. However, this, year, this particular church over the years has grappled with what it means to be faithful. What does it mean to remain in this neighborhood, in this district where many of the active members don't even live? What does it mean to be here? This will continue to be an ongoing conversation as you welcome your new pastor resetting, reaffirming, not just your vision, but the way you live out your vision. What does it mean to live and be God's people in this corner? That's not always an easy question to ask. Getting back to today's gospel, which is a challenging one. Do we even know what it's talking about? We think we do, and I would love to give you all 20 minutes to engage your neighbors about what do you think this means? How do you understand it? One New Testament scholar, Audrey West, says, quote, Jesus in Luke has plenty to say about the dangers of wealth, and we all know that. And yet this parable trades on wealth gained by squandering another's property or ne negotiating with the children of this age. She asks, is dishonesty supposed to be a model for God's reign? Are any of the characters to be understood as good? What are we to make of the relationship between the parable and the maxims appended to its ending? She then says this, could it be, and this is where I tend to come down over and over again, could it be that Jesus' intention is to turn understanding on its head and leave people pondering, requiring a return again and again to both story and storyteller? Hmm. I know it causes me to go back again and again. Okay, what again? What, what, how does this jive with Jesus? Not just in the Gospel of Luke, but what about the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of John? How does this fit? Return again both to story and storyteller when all else fails. Just 
saying, God, you know what? I don't get it. And it may be that God will bring a person or story from another tradition or experience that somehow sheds a light on a piece that makes it clear for me at that particular time. Because the next week I might be just as confused. But there's this dynamic of returning again and again to the story and the storyteller. And that spirit of God from Pentecost is so open that it may direct us to yet other stories. Could be the gospel story understood through the continent of the South. How do Christians in South America hear this same parable? How do Christians in Asia with Buddhist roots or other Asian traditional roots, how do they understand it? What do they hear? Those are the kinds of conversations that I find most meaningful, most enlivening. And it's like that Pentecost spirit blows through the world and through me once again to get back in here and say, yeah, come on, let's go. God is calling disciples to do and to be light, leaven, salt. I can tell you what others have said about today's parable from Luke 16, and I would also like to hear what you think. Now, some of you have heard this parable most of your lives, and others, you might be hearing it for the first time. Wouldn't you like to hear each other's take on it? I think that's how we learn, and that's how we grow. It's not by saying, my understanding is the understanding, because I might only have a little piece of it, but hearing others take on it. And, in, and broadening our understanding or perspective. My question is this, how does this fit with what Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God? If we are, as Audrey says, to return to the story of the storyteller, how does that shape the way we ask questions, the values that we keep or discard, or the way we live our faith? And can this church community be a place where we can support each other's spiritual journey as we grapple with the hard-hitting parables of Jesus? Can we foster such a place? Yeah, we might say, yeah, we want to do that, but how do we do that? Whatever we may think, of this unscrupulous manager, we see that his solution is one that takes into account his neighbors and forces him into other kinds of interactions. There might be selfish reasons behind this. Nevertheless, in the end, everyone wins except for that rich guy. <laughs> now, Audrey West closes her comments by recounting a story she heard from one of her teachers, someone who's taught her not formally, but informally, a professor at a school of veterinary medicine, Dr. George. And Dr. George gave this final exam to his students by telling the story about a sick pig, cow, and a chicken, and gave a whole list of symptoms for the illnesses of these animals with two questions and, and the lab results from a couple of tests. Supplied the students with this information and the final, they were to address two questions. What do you make of the, the data and what is wrong with the, the animals and what's your diagnosis and your next steps? Well, most everyone got a really good grade on this but what the students discovered is that even though they all got really high marks on this, they all had different answers. They all had different responses. And of course, the high achievers, I would suspect they were the high achievers, said, hey, wait, what is the right answer? I've got the right answer. How could you have the right answer? I've got it. So they all went to Professor George to say, what's the right answer, though? 
And the only response he could make was that I gave a good grade to anyone who could make good sense of the data and gave reason for their answer. Showed me they understood what was going on. And that's as much as he would say to them. I know some people are very troubled by that kind of approach when it comes to scripture. It's like we want to pin down these words on the page to something uh, narrow when the words on the page are describing something vastly beyond any of us. And the, what I see as the word, the written word doing, is trying to gather us in, gather the community in to hear, to listen, and to discern together the way forward. That's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to listen to family members, don't you think, than to strangers? Because we can be polite to strangers. But to family members, we just want to say, oh, you're full of it. <laughs> and yet that's what the kingdom of God is showing us is God's intent for us. And we can't get there on our own. <laughs> we get there together, and we get there together with God's spirit. I don't know if I address anything that you had in mind or the questions you had regarding Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. But I hope that if you continue to have questions, you will follow those questions, engage them, and engage one another. Let us trust the generosity and the wisdom of God, who has already forgiven us, who has called us from our birth, and it will be with us now and always. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, I'll give you a little background. Uh, I was 21 and Bill was 22 and we had two small children when we first came to La Mesa. We lived a couple of blocks from the church and I grew up attending First Presbyterian downtown, so La Mesa was a logical choice. The first Sunday we were there, we got our children in the classroom and then we were told we would probably fit in and like the adult Bible study. When we went in, we saw that we were the youngest there by far. Uh, we were, I, I was very shy, didn't say much for a long time and wasn't sure what I was doing there. But the, the people there were wonderful, longtime members who nurtured us and cared for us and led us and gradually we been to, began to grow and do things differently. Uh, later, when Gary Lohman was pastor, he decided to start the Bethel Bible study classes. Came to our house to ask if Bill and I would be in the teacher training. I had never had a minister come to visit me, so I was not even sure about that to start with. Uh, we both said yes, even though I wasn't sure how I was gonna make that. The training lasted for two years, uh, with classes once a week, and after that, then we each led classes for that. Uh, later on, I agreed to lead the adult Bible study and have continued since. Uh, at one point, many years ago, someone at the end of the class asked me how long I had been doing it. And when I told them, they said, you are very durable. I didn't know if that was good or bad. <laughs> I'm gonna let Marty and Roxy talk about why they go to Bible study. I have always felt Bible study was so important. And the first class that Judy was gonna teach after Bethel, I so wanted to go to. It was on Wednesdays and my husband traveled and was out of town on Wednesday, and with four kids, <laughs> I wound up not being able to go. Well, would you believe Gene lost his job? And I had Wednesdays open. <laughs> so I got to be able to go to Bible study, and I've been going ever since. And it seems to me that even though we talk about the old stories, the new things, there's something for me in all the Bible study that applies to me today. So I go to Bible study because it really keeps me going. When we first started coming here 20 years ago, uh, it just seemed logical that we would start attending the adult Bible study class in the mornings and <clears throat> With a lot of things, it becomes a habit. But like Marty, I have noticed that no matter what lessons we are studying, even if I've heard the stories many, many times, something new comes from each story every time. And I'm, I get a chance to hear another person's perspective. I get a chance to offer my perspective. And I have grown a lot by going to the Bible study and I certainly do appreciate Judy for leading the classes each week. One more thing I forgot, the, the material that we use is the present word Bible study. It's used uh, nationwide, and it's a book, the studies that uh, President, former President Jimmy Carter used to teach Bible study, and I assume he's still teaching Bible study. So as you may notice, every week and for the last few weeks, we've got this ministry focus to highlight, give a personal face and story to the many activities that go on within this particular faith community. So now we come to a time for the prayers of the people and you have a list of names in the back of the bulletin listed under prayer concerns names and circumstances that we would like for you to lift up in prayer not just today but in your prayers throughout the week at this time i'd like to ask if there are other prayers someone may have that you would like for the body to yes uh marty
So Carrie's leaving Tuesday. She is going to have chemo and the bone marrow transplant on Thursday. So that's quite another step in her journey, isn't it? Doctors say we'll be starting a new life for Carrie. So thank you for all your prayers. Continue to hold her up in prayer through she goes through this process and the family as well. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Roxy. Fred, did you say Fred? Oh, John. John in Flagst? Kingman. John in Kingman is beginning chemotherapy, okay, for lung cancer. Oh, boy. Yes, Cheryl. Michelle had uh, knee surgery this past Thursday. So prayers are for her continued healing and recovery. Yes, that's good. She's got that dealt with. Yes. Prayers of thanksgiving for finding a new home, safer place, safer environment. So we're glad about that. Joyful about that. Other, any others? Pastor, yes, um, Mike. My husband's here today. And, oh, okay. um, so I'm glad you got here. But also, we have a friend named Chris who uh, landed in the hospital this week oh. with um, a bad bullet and he's recovering at our place. Oh, okay. Um, just kind of while he gets his act after Sure. Her. Prayers of healing for Chris, who's yeah. so staying with George and uh, Mike and George. Right. Yes, Mike. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let us remember that as we're praying for healing, that God heals not just in body, but in mind and spirit and emotion. We may have particular outcomes that we would like to see. And at the same time, we want to allow God's spirit to just move to bring about what is most helpful and what is needed. And we know that things take time, particularly with our bodies, as well as our minds. Um, we may not see miraculous healing. We may see a progression of improvement. Uh, it may be any number of things that will manifest in this, this time. But we pray for God's will and God's healing. We pray to be in alignment with what is life-giving. And may we be patient as well as anticipatory. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the purpose and the meaning of our lives for your call to serve and love our neighbors, for the knowledge that we can make a difference through a smile, a gesture, a gift of time, talent, or treasure. Thank you, God, for moments of pause that frame our lives with spiritual meaning, morning meditation or evening devotions when we rest in your presence and recollect with gratitude your abundant blessings. Oh God, we pray for those who may be in special need today, in need of healing in mind, body, and spirit. We pray for our leaders and for our communities, for those who are living under difficult and challenging conditions. We pray, O oh God of all life, to remind us that we too stand in need of prayers of compassion and assistance. Knit us together as your people, not just here but beyond these walls. Open our eyes to the answered prayers that are around us and the ways that you are using us in this world. 
We thank you for answered prayer. We pray for patience and we pray for understanding. O oh God, united as a community of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Hear us as we join our hearts and our voices in praying the prayer Christ taught us to pray by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends and response to God's generosity, may, me give, may we give of our time, talents, and treasures. Let us pray. Holy God, these offerings are only a portion of all that you have given to us. We give them gratefully and entrust our gifts to your work in this world. May our acts of giving and service help unburden those with the heaviest loads. May our giving be the sign of our commitment 
to your good news of the gospel. Amen. Now may we leave this house of worship strengthened by the Spirit, renewed by God's grace, and supported by the body of Christ. May the grace, hope, peace, and love of God be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>